Hey, what's up guys? My name is Acherno, and there's a Java update available. Anyway, my name is Acherno, and welcome to devlog number 11 um, of the Sparky Game Engine. So, this devlog's really gonna just be, uh, like, basically me explaining my plans for the next week or so, um, for the next month, really, I think. Um, because I didn't really do much over the last week. As you know, I was preparing for the release, which came out on Thursday, which was the 31st of March. So after that, since Thursday, I basically haven't worked on Sparky. Like I've checked a few things out and I've tested a few things, but I don't think I've added any more code or fixed any bugs really. Um, so there's not really much new that I can share with you guys, but I do want to show you a few things that I noticed, um, because of course I did release it on, uh, I did release like the Sparky March release on, um, on Thursday, the 31st of March. So if we take a look at GitHub, if you just go to github.com forward slash the Cherno forward slash Sparky, you'll see um, the Sparky repository. Um, we hit 300 stars, which is pretty awesome. So if there's anyone who hasn't starred the repository yet, then first first thing you should do is go ahead and go to the link in the description and hit the star button because uh, because that's that's very important. But anyway, um, you can see that in the commit that I <laughs> that I made, uh, there was the Sparky March release, um, which was a huge commit. Uh, if we look at the actual log for that, you'll see that 653 changed files with 100,000 additions in lines of code and 2,144 deletions. Um, a lot of the additions, obviously, are just me putting free image in, um, but there is a lot of code that got written. Um, so uh, it was very, very huge. You can see there's like the, there's even a whole release notes thing, and this was actually made into an actual release. So if you go to releases, you can see that there's a uh, 0.1 I'm calling it, which is um, the March 2016 release, which is pretty cool. So we released that. Uh, here it is as a full kind of um, change log here. It's kind of more like release notes. Um, and that's pretty cool. So because of that, and one of the big motivations for me finally doing a release was uh, two things. First of all, um, we can actually start proper bug tracking. So you can see that people have been opening issues over the last few days and we've been closing some as well. Um, so that's been going pretty, pretty good. And then of course, pull requests. Now, um, it's going to take a while for these pull requests to get processed. Um, like as in, I expect it's going to take you guys a while before you can actually open up pull requests because, um, there needs to be a few things really needs to happen for that. First of all, you need to kind of understand how the engine works. And I expect that anyone who's actually interested in it, it'll take you guys probably a few weeks, especially with, without me putting out a video, um, to kind of know your way around the engine, uh, especially if you're kind of new to C++, like engine programming, um, and OpenGL and DirectX. But uh, eventually I obviously want you guys to, to submit pull requests because I will accept them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mentioned in the release video that it's just impossible for me to kind of manage this project by myself. So I would love people to contribute. Um, but anyway, all the code is here. So physically based rendering, DirectX and OpenGL, all the code you need is here. Like if you want to, I think sandbox shaders, advanced lighting dot shader and advanced lighting dot HLSL are the two PBR shaders. Um, so you can see all the code for that over here. Um, so that's, that's out. Really, it doesn't syntax highlight HLSL. That's odd. But anyway, um, so uh, that's finally out there. But I, know, I know that a lot of people were really interested in physically based rendering. And um, whilst I probably won't do a video on how it works for a while, just because I don't have time, uh, you can certainly kind of start to uh, dissect it. And I highly recommend you guys read the the Moving Frostbite to PBR uh, paper. It's about 120 pages and um, Sparky's uh, Sparky's implementation of PBR is loosely based on it. Not really loosely. It's about a 90% taken from there. There are a few changes I've made here and there, mostly to stuff like um, roughness and smoothness curves and a few things here and there, but it's, it's roughly the same. See what I did there? I said uh, it's roughly the same and roughness is uh, PBR. Anyway, so the idea is that um, uh, definitely take a look at that if you, if you were interested in that because it's, it's, it's up there now. Um, and as you can see, I did like, for example, accept, uh, I did accept a pull requests from TGSM. So he's the first official contributor to Sparky that isn't me, who of course removed the letter A that I accidentally had in my shader, causing it to not compile uh, for OpenGL. But anyway, um, so thank you for that. Uh, cool. So anyway, that, that's how that, that, that's up there now. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, 
everything should work, I believe. The only thing that's not included here is the actual, if you go to tools, uh, dependencies, there's only the include folder for FBX, okay? The libraries for FBX, which are needed by SPM build, um, are not in the Git repository because they are over 100 megabytes and GitHub does, GitHub does not allow files above 100 megabytes. And in fact, Git in general doesn't deal well with large files, large binary files, but GitHub just straight up doesn't allow it, so I couldn't do anything. So you need to install the FBX SDK. Um, it doesn't really have to be version 2016.1.2, like 2016 will work fine. Um, and then you have to copy the lib folders into dependencies slash FBX SDK slash lib, and then you can put them there. Uh, because as you can see, SPM build uh, depends on, um, where is it, library path? Yeah, so like x86 slash release, um, and the input for the linker is like additional dependencies, here they are. So it needs like in this case, lib FPX SDK hyphen MD for the debug version um, and the release version, it seems. That's probably not even right. <laughs> I know that there's two libraries, there's a debug and there's a release version. Anyway, the idea is that that's the only thing that you'll need to actually do yourself. Otherwise, everything should work fine. And I should probably extern this or like, I don't know, I might have to put it a little note being like, you need to download and install the FPX SDK. Okay, cool. So the question now, the burning question on everyone's mind is what's going to happen on the, over the next week. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. One of the things that I wanted to mention before we do that, though, is people have been, been playing around with Sparky, obviously, now that it's out there. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, doing some tests, like building scenes and then um, uh, essentially checking out, like, the performance of Sparky. Um, and then, like, reporting, hey, like, I do this and it makes everything slow. Um, or I try and, you know, I, I, I built this scene and it's running really slowly. Um, and that's fine. That's obviously great. I, I absolutely love that you guys are doing that. But one thing that I want to mention real quick is that if I run, um, when you're profiling, right, it's very important that you actually profile in release mode. And I just want to show you this right now. So you can see that just running Sandbox and DirectX uh, 11, we get this scene rendering at about seven to eight milliseconds per frame, six, six to eight, I'll say milliseconds per frame, right? Um, which is pretty slow, right? And I expect it to be slow. As I said, DirectX is very, very not optimized yet in Sparky. I'm doing some very horrible things that I should definitely not be doing. But anyway, the point is that it's running around six to eight milliseconds, right? If I just switch that up to release mode and run it, and that's all I've done is just switch the configuration to release mode and I run it. First of all, init took like a quarter of the time, but also you'll see that the frame time is now three milliseconds, okay? Three to four, so it's about twice as fast. In fact, it's exactly twice as fast, okay? It's taking half the time to render. So that's just a little heads up for you guys that if you are doing profiles and you're reporting that like, this is the scene I'm using, this is the hardware I'm using, this is the performance, make sure you do that in release mode because I don't really care about debug mode, right? Debug mode is doing a lot of things. It's not even doing, it's not even doing a lot of debug things yet, but you can see that it's significantly slower, okay? It's half, it's, it's, it takes double the time to render frames, okay? So that's just something that I wanted to uh, throw out there so that you guys realize that um, when you are profiling, you should be profiling with full optimization on. Okay, cool. And that's what the, the release configuration in Sparky is set up for like full optimization. Um, and we did that very early on. I think when we were profiling the batch renderer, we did that. So it's got like full inlining of functions wherever possible. It's got stuff like intrin like SSE um, and uh, floating point, you know, is set to like fast and the really the, the whole compiler setting is set to fast code rather than uh, small code or like compact code. But anyway, the point is it's, it's very, it's, it's full optimization is on. Okay, so that now that's out of the way, let's take a look at what we're gonna do over the next week or month. So this is the Trello board, bit.ly forward slash Sparky Trello, link in the description. I uh, encourage you guys to take a look at this because this is the roadmap for Sparky. You can comment on issues as well and comment on things that are going on and I will get them. I'm usually pretty responsive. For example, you can see me like replying here. That's me, Jan Chernikov. Um, you can see me replying here everywhere and like I'm pretty active here because this is, I use this all the time. Like when I'm working on Sparky, I usually have this open. Um, so this is what's gonna happen, right? I asked you guys last time what you wanted to see next and you really didn't mind too much. So I decided to take the, um, the lead here and say that what we're gonna be working on is essentially the next big thing that I wanna put into Sparky is a level editor. 
okay? Because it's very annoying that uh, all of you guys who are now creating scenes have to kind of create it by hand, like in code, um, and it, it kind of gets very messy. And also, it that means that it's subject to how you guys set things up, right? For example, you might create duplicate materials in places, and there's not really much control I have over how it actually, like it depends on how you write the code. And you, some of you might be writing slow code. So instead of doing all that, and of course, the, the, the major issue here being that it will take a, take a lot more time to code this stuff up than to use a level editor. Um, uh, I'm going to just basically start working on a level editor. Now, a lot has to be done before we can actually do a level editor. Okay, there are basically two, two large things that need to be done. Okay, there needs to be a serialization library. So we need to be able to obviously save the level data out into a format that the engine can read at runtime. And then uh, for the for since I'm going to write the editor in C sharp WPF, um, we need uh, we need to either write the like a wrapper for the entire engine's API in in C CLI so that we can access the engine um, via C sharp, or we can write a tool that just wraps everything for us. So I'm going to be opting for the latter method because it's going to be absolutely unmaintainable to have to keep <laughs> um, manually changing the CLI wrapper every time uh, the API for Sparky changes. So anyway, so CLI generates generates C plus CLI wrapping code for the engine. Um, uh, that yeah. So this guy's on the right track here. Um, we're probably not going to we're not going to use Windows Forms. We're gonna because we're kind of trying to be more modern. Um, and WBF is a little bit more powerful, a little bit steeper learning curve. But I've been using it for a while now, probably about a year or so. Um, so I know how it works. Uh, I would say I still don't know how it works, but um, it uh, it's I'm, pr I'm I'm kind of okay, f like familiar with it. So I will be using WPF. Um, and the idea is that uh, once we have that CLI generator up and running, we can start working on the level editor. So that's kind of the first thing that needs to get done. That's why it's on critical. Now for the serialization side of things, um, which is, is kind of going to be similar to the serialization series I did in Java. It's going to be a little bit different though. Obviously we can optimize a lot more because it'll be written in C++, but also like I'm, I'm going to probably optimize the format a lot more. Um, for that, I do really want to create a virtual file system. So what I mean by that is a, like a VFS essentially is, um, uh, here we go. So like I've put a little bit of a, um, uh, of, of a description here, and that pretty much outlines exactly what I wanted to say, right? Um, with a VFS, we can do things like um, just say slash res, and then slash, you know, texture.png. And like, essentially, like when we create mount points using the VFS, um, it will just resolve the path based on the mount points. So basically, like the engine, when it loads things from certain um, paths, those paths can actually get translated into different paths when it comes to actually loading the file. So you can kind of refer to it um, independently, right? So basically what I mean is I could write slash res, you know, like slash res slash texture.png, but really I would be meaning like, you know, it might be like slash resources slash published slash textures slash texture.png. So that's what it could resolve to. And then obviously this depends on what platform you're on because it might be stored in different like in different um, directories based on the platform and based on like the texture compression format as well. Because a common thing obviously to do it would be like if you're on different platforms and I'm more talking about stuff like mobile, um, you might want to use a texture compression format that is, you know, for that particular device. Um, and so you might have different textures to load and you can kind of use the VFS to switch which one actually gets loaded, but the engine and everything refers to it as just like that, which is really easy. Um, the other really important part is that we can eventually support reading from binary blobs. What I mean by that is you can have all of your resources packed into a single file, right? And like, I literally mean just like take the bytes and just keep appending them to the end, right? And you get a big blob. <laughs> um, and that blob, of course, you should, you, you still want to be able to say, hey, files, hey, like I want to read this file. But then if you're using a binary blob, it will actually just look up an offset in that blob, probably open a memory map to it or something, and then just give you the data you want, right? So it's just kind of, um, it's pretty much like creating like an asset server, right? Creating something that will, like we can ask for an asset on disk and it'll just kind of give it to us. Um, and the way that it gives it to us is the engine will take care of that, right? You just 
say something as simple as that, and it will resolve the path itself. Okay, whether that, whether, again, whether that be in a, in a binary blob or um, actually some folder, right, on our um, computer. Also, if you, you know, you can write stuff out like data slash save dot dat, right? And basically, you know, the VFS will be like, okay, you're in the slash data, so I might resolve that to being like, you know, um, if you're on Windows to being like app data slash game name slash blah, 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 right? So you can kind of see how um, it just makes everything a lot more simple because obviously slash like this path is Windows only um, and Mac might, you know, might be in like home or whatever if you're on Linux and there's so many things, um, so many things that it could be, right? So that's kind of the idea, right? Um, and I want to do that. That shouldn't take too long. I imagine like the, like not the binary blob stuff, but just the, like the virtual file system um, probably should take about a couple of days if I actually spend time working on it. So that'll be done quickly. And then I'll probably do the serialization stuff, then the CLI generator, then the level editor. So I expect these three things to be done by the end of the month. And then the level editor maybe might be hopefully somewhat released in May, like at the end of May, maybe. That's kind of my timeline for this, very loose, but that is, that's that. So anyway, thanks guys for watching this episode. Um, this devlog, uh, if you guys enjoy Sparky and you want to support it and you, you know, the, the best way to support it is actually, I, I opened up Patreon, but really the best way to support it would be to contribute. But if you can't do that, then you can always become a patron, get uh, access to code early. I'm probably going to stay on GitHub for a while, um, but uh, eventually I probably will switch, switch, switch back to Vezhna because it's a lot easier and it's a lot faster for me uh, to use than, than GitHub. Like, for, like if, for some reason it took me like, I don't know, two hours almost to, down, to download a fresh checkout of this, which is just absolutely ridiculous, whereas this is just sold on my server. But anyway, um, and Versioner actually does deal with large binary files like the FBX stuff perfectly, right? I can't even have my FBX SDK here, whereas I do have it on Versioner. Um, and Versioner doesn't choke like Git does when it sees large binary files. So in that sense, Versioner is actually better than Git, um, although it is still not 100% complete. But anyway, um, you can always support me here if you enjoy this stuff. You don't have to, but it certainly helps. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time, next week, next Monday with another devlog. Goodbye.